Welcome to Enter the Unknown. My name is FJ and we're back today with a brand new random car challenge video. This has been a series up till now, but I'm trying something new today. We've made it through Kanto, Johto, Hoenn and Sinnoh, so today we're headed to Unova. We're starting on a journey where I'll attempt to answer the question, can you beat Pokemon White 2 with random teams drawn from cards for every major battle? Basically, for every rival encounter, gym battle and evil team leader we come across, we'll be drawing enough cards to match our opponent's team. Then, we match levels exactly and take them on in a set battle with no items allowed. I'll be staggering the cards added so we don't end up taking on the first gym with like Mewtwo, but other than that, we can get started. The first draw that needs to be done is the one to determine our rival starter. I don't have a single Tepig card on hand, so instead we'll just be shuffling up Grass, Fire and Water energies. Those three stacks in the background are the different levels of cards we'll be adding in along the way. Anyway, he will be going on his journey with an Oshawott, so now it's time to take a look at the first group of cards being added. These are the cards of the Pokemon whose base stat totals fall between 0 and 350. If all goes to plan, these will be the only cards available to us until we take on Elisa in Nimbasa City. There are a lot of good cards in here, so hopefully we'll draw some interesting teams. Alright, the final draw we need to do for now is to determine the Pokemon we'll be using in our first face-off with Hugh. For the opening battle of our run, we're going to be using... Wismer. That's an okay draw. Wismer has a base stat total of 240, which is a little bit below average for this group and a fair bit less than Oshawa. There's never much going on in a battle between two level 5s though, so we shouldn't have an issue here. The team overview won't take too long, we've just got D-Pad the Wismer, who's equipped with Pound and Uproar. That's actually a great starter moveset, especially after Uproar almost doubled in power in Gen 5. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's get this thing started. Our one-on-one -on -one battle with Hugh gets underway with Oshawott facing off against Wismer, obviously. The water starter charges in and uses Tackle before D-Pad lets out an ear-piercing uproar. The force of the sound wave sent Oshawott flying backwards, but he spins and uses Tail Whip to lower Wismer's defense. D-Pad's uproar connects again though, and that's enough to put an end to Oshawott and the battle. Yeah, the combo of uproar and Wismer's solid special attack stat really made that quite easy. On to the next one. Again, it's a 1v1 against Hugh, but this time we're at Flockacy Ranch. Not much has changed, honestly. Oshawott is up to level 8, but unlike most second rival battles, Hugh hasn't added any new Pokemon. So we'll be drawing a single card once again. For the second rival battle, we're going to be using a Sandshrew. We're at a type disadvantage, but Oshawott is without stab moves, so it's not really a problem. Styles the Sandshrew has a full moveset made up of Scratch, Defense Curl, Sand Attack and Rollout, which is again really solid at this stage. As these early battles usually go, this one's another back and forth between two moves. Sandshrew's Scratch and Oshawott's Tackle. Styles hits harder and has a superior defense stat, so once again it's an easy win for us. Our next port of call is Aspersia City, where we'll have our first gym battle with Charon. The normal type gym leader just has the two Pokemon, so we'll be drawing the same and our duo will be... Solosis and Electrike. That's another good draw. At level 11, Hanbro the Solosis has Psy Wave, Snatch, Reflect, and Rollout, so pretty good. Then at level 13, Bolt the Electrike's got Tackle, Leer, Howl, and Thunder Wave. Somehow, every time I draw an Electrike in a random card challenge, there's either no available Electric type moves or no use for any. Anyway, we get the battle started with Charon's Patrat taking on our Solosis, and thanks to Bite, it's not a great matchup. Psywave keeps Hanbro in the running, but for some reason with both Pokemon weak, Charon opts to use a potion instead of finishing the job. Luckily for him, Solosis fails to connect with the Psywave, so the questionable decision goes unpunished. One Patrat Tackle takes out Hanbro, so now we're in a one on two. We send out Electric, who starts by paralyzing Patrat with Thunder Wave. That genuinely has no effect as the Red Eyes Brown Raton breaks through turn after turn to use Work Up. While that was going on though, Bolt was using Howl to continue boosting his own attack. After a few turns of back and forth posturing, Electrike slams into Patrat, but it falls just short of the KO. Finally though, that's the turn that the paralysis kicks in, so a second tackle levels up the match. Charon's Lillipup joins the battle and is immediately hit by a tackle before countering with an identical attack. Bolt static leaves him paralyzed though, and that signals the end. One more tackle sends Lillipup crashing backwards, leaving him unconscious at Charon's feet. The defeated gym leader hands over the basic badge, so we're on our way. After heading out of Aspersia City, we go straight to Verbank where the next gym leader awaits. Roxy also uses a team of two, and for this one we'll have to make do with Duskull and Tynamo. These have been some fun starting teams. Togu the Duskull's at level 16 for this one, and he's equipped with Nightshade, Leer, Disable, and Astonish. 
Tynamo can only learn four moves, so unsurprisingly, Unagi is working with Spark, Thunder Wave, Tackle, and Charge Beam. Early on, that's actually pretty OP, so this was a really good time to draw Tynamo. Alright, let's get into it. The battle begins with Roxy's Coughing taking on Duskull, and even though the Poison type knows Assurance, Togu takes control. With Nightshade and a critical hit on Astonish, Duskull starts us out with a win, but Roxy's second Pokemon is a Whirlipede. This is the first time we'll be facing an evolved Pokemon, and although Togu manages to lower her defense with Leer, Pursuit quickly leaves us in a one-on-one. -on -one. Tynamo enters the battle and uses Thunder Wave, but Whirlipede ignores the paralysis and strikes with Venoshock. Even with Roxy constantly calling for Protect, Unagi can't be stopped. Two shots of Spark cast Whirlipede aside, earning us the win and the Toxic Badge. That's two. Once again, we're without any major battles between gyms, so we can move right on to Berg and Castelia City. For the first time, we'll be using a team of three, and we've got Meditite, Larvitar, and Shroomish. This one is a pretty mixed bag. Up first, we've got Vita the Larvitar, who has the moves Rock Slide, Screech, Sandstorm, and Bite. Asana the Meditite's at level 22, the same as Larvitar, and her moveset's made up of Confusion, Detect, Meditate, and Hidden Power. That's a Fire-type Hidden Power, which will definitely come in handy. Finally, we've got Spory the Shroomish at level 24, and he's got Mega Drain, Stun Spore, Leech Seed, and Headbutt. To be honest, he's actually called Sporgasbord, but that wouldn't fit, so I had to settle for Spory. Berg sends out his Swadloon to start, and we call on Larvitar. We've made it to the point now where opposing trainers have Pokemon far stronger than ours, so we're going to have to work for this one. Vita just tears through Swadloon to get things going, though. Like, Berg used a Hyper Potion, and Larvitar just didn't care. Berg's Levani comes out next, though, and just instantly ties things up. A quad effective Razor Leaf blows away Vita in one, so all of that hard work against Swadloon is quickly forgotten. We send out Meditite to replace Larvitar, and even though she's able to get off a quad effective move of her own, Levani is so overpowered that Asana's knocked out in two hits. That leaves us with only Shroomish, so not great. Levani connects with a super effective Struggle Bug before Spore is able to get off a Stun Spore, which thankfully lands. Shroomish then hops towards his paralyzed opponent and just starts headbutting. Levani wraps Spory up with String Shot after String Shot as he just persists with headbutt. After four blows land, a string covered Shroomish watches on as Levani collapses, leaving Berg with only one. The Castelia gym leader sends out his Dwebble, and although he can barely move, Spory goes for a Leech Seed. Greatly hindered from all the string wrapped around him, though, Shroomish is clobbered by a Smackdown before he can move. Once Leech Seed connects though, it's basically just a race to see whether Dwebble can knock off Shroomish before Mega Drain saps the remainder of his hit points. With all of the HP Sporys recovering, it's too much for Dwebble to overcome and Leech Seed hands us another win. Berg forks over the Insect Badge and for services to the Art of Battle, Spory evolves. That was pretty damn heroic. When Meditite went down, I was pretty sure we lost that one. Maybe we'll see more of Spory later. Anyway, now that we're done with Berg, we can leave Castelia City behind and travel to Nimbasa. Colorus blocks our path on Route 4 though, so we've got one more battle with the original stack of cards. The two Pokemon we'll be using against Colorus are Rufflet and Ponyard. Okay, those are two of the strongest Pokemon we could have drawn, but type-wise we're not in great shape. Crinkle the Rufflet's at level 21 with Wing Attack, Leer, Scary Face, and Home Claws so we'll probably be quite reliant on Knives the Pawniard. At level 23, her moves are Rock Smash, Leer, Scary Face, and Faint Attack, which should do better against a Magnemite and a Clink. Let's see how this goes. We send Rufflet out into a Raging Sandstorm to take on Magnemite, and honestly, I had no intention of ever attacking here. Crinkle's only job is to lower the Magnet Ball's defense to make things easier for Pawniard. Leer connects twice, so that'll help a bit, but really that's all I could think to do with Rufflet. When Knives comes in, she blasts Magnemite with Rock Smash, but Sturdy prevents the one-shot. Probably should have just gone for a wing attack with Crinkle in retrospect. Thunder Wave leaves Ponyard paralyzed, and after a Super Potion, Rock Smash is denied a KO by Sturdy once more. After getting hit by Spark, Knives breaks through Paralysis to attack with Rock Smash again, this time scoring the knockout. When Colra sends out Clink, it's slow going for Ponyard, who's hampered by the Paralysis, but after a couple of Thundershocks, she gets back to work. Eventually, Rock Smash scores a second knockout, giving us the win over Colrest, so let's move on to Nimbasa. Alright, we've made it through a lot of tough battles now, but Elisa has a Zev Striker, and Pokemon at 350 and below probably won't cut it here. So these are all of the Pokemon whose base stat totals fall between 351 and 450. We've got a Mawile in here, so we should be good. 
With a whole new group of cards added to the pile, we're ready to take on Elisa in the Nimbasa Gym. For the fourth unit of a gym battle, we're going to be using the team of Mistrevus, Snover, and Minan. That's a pretty fun trio. Shadow the Mistrevus is at level 28 with the moves Psybeam, Spite, Confuse Ray, and Hex. Ira the Snover is also at level 28 and she's equipped with Icy Wind, Grass Whistle, Swagger, and Ice Shard. Lastly, we've got Argunas the Minan, whose moveset's made up of Quick Attack, Charm, Thunder Wave, and Electro Ball. This is a pretty good team, but I don't think this is going to be easy. Let's give it a try. Elisa leads off with her Amolga, and we get things started with Mistrevus. An early pursuit strikes Shadow, but he counters with a side beam that knocks Amolga out of the air. After another pursuit lands, Mistrevus uses a Confuse Ray to leave Amolga dazed and... Yeah, you get it. That causes the flying Pikachu clone to glide headfirst into the wall of the gym before a second side beam finishes her off. Elisa calls on her Aceb Striker next, and clearly she has a favourite move. Shadow is struck by another pursuit, but surviving the hit, he successfully confuses another opponent. Zeb Striker gallops down the catwalk and just full sends into the crowd, damaging everyone around, including herself. A side beam then drags her kicking and screaming back through the crowd into the stage before another pursuit finally puts an end to Mistrevus. I'm pretty sure nobody is ever coming back to watch Elisa after this. We go out to Minan next, who isn't particularly well suited for this one, but we don't have a better option. Thanks to Shadow's Confuse Ray, Argunas can will Zeb Striker's HP down until Elisa's forced to bust out a Hyper Potion. After the confusion wears off, the two go back and forth with Quick Attack and Flame Charge, and Zeb Striker gets the win with a Quick Attack of her own. So, we're in a 1 on 2, starting against a fiery rampaging Zeb Striker with a Quad Weak Snover. Hmm. Iris Snow Warning starts an indoor hail as a Flame Charge sends her careening backwards. Somehow, Snover survives, so she's able to attack with Icy Wind before the hail knocks off Zev Striker. Well, that's one. Now we've just got to defeat a Flaffy with 11 hit points remaining. Snover succeeds in putting the sheep to sleep with Grass Whistle and then uses Swagger to confuse her. An Icy Wind deals some solid damage to Iris' sleeping foe, and when she wakes up, the confusion kicks in and she hits herself. So, one more Icy Wind connects, and that's it. Snover has somehow made it through the one on two to hand us the win and earn us Sinnoh Badge number four. That's two unbelievable gym performances in a row. Elisa hands over the Bolt Badge, meaning it's time to move on to Driftvale City. Before heading to the gym to take on Clay though, we've got a battle with one of the original Team Plasma Sages. Rude is waiting for us at the old Plasma safe house looking for a two on two battle. For this one, we're going to be using Poochiana and Metapod. That isn't great. We've got Chrysalis the Metapod at level 27, and he's got Tackle, Harden, String Shot, and Bug Bite. Not the best, but we can make it work. Banzai the Poochien is also at 27 and has Bite, Sand Attack, Roar, and Howl. This really isn't going to be easy. Rude leads off with his Herdier, and we start with Metapod, whose nearly non-existent attack is instantly lowered by Intimidate. That's a decent start. After a takedown, Rude turns his attention to work up, allowing Chrysalis to attack with several bug bites. Eventually, Rude calls for another takedown, which knocks out Metapod and leaves Herdier badly injured. Thanks to Rude's work up spree, Poochiana only needs one bite to KO Herdier, taking us into a one on one. Rude throws out his second Pokeball, releasing Swoobat, and that actually works out pretty well for us. Bonsai just has to watch Swoobat use Imprison before latching on with a bite that one shots the Psychic Bat to earn us a surprisingly easy win. That wasn't the way I thought that would go. With Root out of the way though, it's time to move on to the gym. Clay's in charge of the Driftvale City Gym, and he uses a team of three, so that's how many cards we'll need to draw. For our fifth unit of a gym battle, we're going to be using Seal, Cottony, and Machoke. Type-wise, that's pretty perfect for a ground-type gym leader who has two Pokemon weak to fighting. Alright, at level 31 we've got Ataria the Seal, and her moveset's made up of Aqua Jet, Rest, Ice Shard, and Headbutt. Candy the Cottony is also at 31, and she's got Giga Drain, Stun Spore, Cotton Spore, and Charm. Finally, we've got Champ the Machoke at level 33, and Revenge, Leer, Vital Throw, and Low Sweep make up his moveset. This one should be pretty easy. Let's get into it. The battle gets going with Clay's Crocorock facing off against Seal. On her second Aqua Jet, Ataria scores a critical hit to wipe out the partial dark type, giving us the lead. When Clay calls on Sand Slash, Seal keeps pressing with Aqua Jets, but a Crush Claw evens things up. Candy the Cottony replaces Ataria though, and a single Giga Drain immediately restores our advantage. Clay's Excadrill comes out last, but Candy paralyzes him with Stun Spore right away. 
After completely destroying X-Girl's attack with charm, we make a switch out to Machoke who grabs the weaponized mole and hurls him into the wall. Vital Throw is good for an easy one-shot, finishing off Clay to earn us the Quake Badge. We're not done in Driftvale City just yet though. Before leaving, we've got to head to the Pokemon World Tournament and we're gonna need a team of three that we can use for all of our battles there. For our three Pokemon World Tournament face-offs, we'll be using Bulbasaur, Torchic, and Magikarp. Ah, the original three starters. To win the Driftvale Tournament, we'll have to win three battles back to back to back with this heroic trio. There are no experience points to be gained, so our whole team is at level 25 here and they will remain that way. Shalot the Bulbasaur has Energy Ball, Leech Seed, Sleep Powder, and Venishock. Viera the Torchic's got Fire Pledge, Growl, Sand Attack, and Return. Last up, we've got Poseidon the Magikarp, who's equipped with Tackle, Splash, Flail, and Bounce. Alright, this is gonna be a mess. Let's just make an attempt. Starting with Hugh. Duot and Shalot get the tournament underway, and a single Energy Ball decimates the Evolved Water Starter to give us the perfect start. When Hugh sends out his Tranquil, we swap Bulbasaur for Magikarp, who allows an Air Cutter to knock him out just to lull Hugh into a false sense of security. We call on Torchic next, who settles on just slamming Tranquil with repeated returns. Although Air Cutter blows Fierro back, Return eventually knocks out the Flyer to leave Hugh with only his Simi Sage. Sadly, a Seed Bomb blows away Torchic before he can use Fire Pledge, so we're into a grassy one-on-one. Shalot the Bulbasaur re-enters the battle and uses Sleep Powder to put Simi Sage to sleep. From there, it's a pretty simple two-shot Venishot to destroy the Grass Monkey, earning us a win in the quarterfinals. Our semi-final battle is a rematch against Charon, and he starts things off with his Stoutland. We lead off with Bulbasaur once again, and after being intimidated by the Mustachioed Mutt, he uses Sleep Powder. With Stoutland asleep, Shalot can happily send a couple of Energy Balls crashing into him to let sleeping dogs lie. Charon calls on his Watchhog next, and we make a switch of our own out to Poseidon. For some reason, the Aspersia Gym Leader actually lets Magikarp just flop over and hit Watchog with multiple tackles. By the time a bite cuts down Poseidon, Watchog's HP has dropped to around half. We go out to Torchic next, and worryingly, Watchog uses another workup. When a return isn't enough for a knockout, Watchog uses Hypnosis to put Piero to sleep. After using Confuse Ray, Watchog grabs the sleeping starter and uses a couple of bites to take us down to one. Bulbasaur comes back out next, and thankfully, his energy ball lands before Watchog can attack again. Charon's Chinchino is out last, and the gym leader decides to call for... Workup. That's new. That just gives us a free turn to use Sleep Powder, and Shalot makes no mistake putting his opponent to sleep. As the Driftvale City Tournament MVP, Bulbasaur has no problem attacking twice with Energy Ball to give us another win. A Shalot sweep has earned us a place in the finals, so let's see what Colress has to offer. The decider gets going with Bulbasaur facing off against Magneton, and as it's our main strategy for every opponent, we start things with Sleep Powder. As the bag of bolts falls asleep, we recall Shalot and send out Torchic, whose attacks should be a lot more useful. Before Fierro can even get off a Fire Pledge though, Magneton wakes up and paralyzes him with a Thunder Wave. After getting bullied for a few turns, Torchic finally manages to attack, blowing away Magneton with a Fire Pledge. LGM's up next, and as we've done in every single battle, we make a switch out to Magikarp. One Psybeam KOs Poseidon, so all in all, not the best showing from everyone's favorite water starter. Shalot comes back out and fires off an energy ball before Colress calls for Heal Block. That has literally no impact, so a second energy ball wipes out LGM to leave us in a 2 on 1. Clink is up last for Colress, and after Bulbasaur succeeds with Sleep Powder, we make another switch out to Torchic. Repeated charges don't do anything to stop Torchic, who eventually picks up the win with Fire Pledge. Against all odds, our team of scrappy starters have won the Driftvale City Tournament. I really didn't think we could win that one. I just guess anything is possible when Magikarp's on your side. After leaving Driftvale behind, we can head onwards to Miss Tralton City, where the sixth unit of a gym awaits us. Skyla's flying-type team has an average base stat total over 450, so it's probably a good time to add the final stack of cards. This group contains every Pokémon with a base stat total north of 450. We've now got a great group of cards in the mix, so we can really draw just about any team. For the Mistralton City Gym Battle, we're going to be using the team of... Gyarados, Swellow, and Steelix. Okay, yeah, that's pretty solid. Hydra the Gyarados is at level 37, and her moveset's made up of Ice Fang, Dragon Rage, Aqua Tail, and Thrash. Tweet the Swellow's also at 37, and he's got Quick Attack, Double Team, Endeavor, and Wing Attack. Finally, Strongy the Steelix is at level 39 with the moves Rock Slide, Ice Fang, Thunder Fang, and Crunch. This really shouldn't be too hard. Let's give it a go. 
Skyla gets the battle going with Swoobat and we start out with Gyarados who crunches down with an Ice Fang for an early knockout. When Skyla brings in Swanna, we switch out to Steelix. It's not the best matchup, but Stronky knows Thunder Fang, so this swap makes some sense. The Steel Snake only manages to get off a single quad effective attack before falling to Swanna's Bubble Beam though. Thanks to a Citrus Berry, Stronky hasn't even left Swanna below half health. We send Gyarados back into battle and she attacks with Ice Fang before we move on to Thrash. Skyla calls for Roost to try to prolong Swanna's time in battle, but Hydra slams the Water Bird with a powerful Thrash to finish things. Skarmory's up last for Skyla, who resists Gyarados' Thrash, so we switch out to Swallow for the first time. We don't really have any way to deal good damage to Skarmory with Tweak though. Before even taking Skyla's final Pokemon below half health, the Steel Wing leaves us in a one-on-one. -on -one. Skarmory's Air Cutter isn't much of an issue for Gyarados though, so even with a Skyla Hyper Potion, Aqua Tail gives us a fairly easy win. Not as easy as I thought it would be though, probably due to mismanagement on my part. Jet patch in hand, it's time to move on from Astroton City to Undella Town. On the way through town, Hughes stops us, ready for another rival battle. We'll need a team of three once again here, so let's see how Regice, Breloom, and Masquerade do. Probably pretty well, I'm guessing. Nevera the Regice is at level 39, with Icy Wind, Curse, Ancient Power, and Explosion. Spory the Breloom makes his return also at 39, knowing the moves Mega Drain, Stun Spore, Leech Seed, and Sky Uppercut. Finally, at level 41, Rombi the Masquerade is equipped with Silver Wind, Stun Spore, Gust, and Ominous Wind. This might be the most overpowered team we've had as far as specific matchups go. There's basically no way to lose this one. The battle starts with Regice facing off against Hughes on Pheasant, and it just seems a little bit unfair. An Air Slash barely leaves a mark on Nevera, who knocks the bird out of the air with an icy wind. When Hugh sends out his Samurott, instead of switching, we just call for Explosion. It doesn't deal that much damage, but I want to use the whole team here, and this was easier than switching. Breloom comes in next, and thanks to a Hyper Potion, it takes a while, but Mega Drain ultimately gets the better of Samurott. Spory then blasts the entering Simi Sage with a Sky Uppercut before returning to his ball to make way for Masquerade. Rombi Silverwind takes down Hugh's final team member to hand us a fairly routine win. In retellings, I'm sure he'll focus on the part where he faced and took down a Regi, so it's nice for him too. This really doesn't happen often in random guard challenges, but that team may have been a bit too good for that particular battle. Maybe the next gym will pose a tougher test. In Opelucid City, Drayden awaits us with his glorious beard and team of three, so it's time for another draw. Against the Dragon-type specialist, we're going to be using the trio of Bayleaf, Luminion, and Primate. Drayden uses three fully evolved dragons, so we're gonna need a strong showing here. Up first, we've got Koba the Primate at level 48, who's equipped with Cross Chop, Screech, Swagger, and Thrash. Flo the Luminion is back down at 46, and she's got Icy Wind, Attract, Rain Dance, and Surf. Last but not least, Spice the Bayleaf's also at 46, with Magical Leaf, Poison Powder, Synthesis, and Hidden Power. That's a conveniently ice-typed hidden power, which we'll definitely need if we're to win this one. Let's give it a go. The penultimate unit of a gym battle gets underway with Primate facing off against Drudigan. Koba closes the distance and begins thrashing, dealing serious damage to the dragon, but he counters quickly with revenge. The attack shakes off Primate, but he stomps back towards Drudigan and continues thrashing. Drayden's first Pokemon falls and he sends out Flygon next, who has the advantage of flight over Koba. All that thrashing has left Primate confused too, and that combined with the Flygon Earth Power is too much to survive. After Koba falls, we call on Flo next, who starts by sending a gust of icy wind at Flygon. It doesn't quite do enough to knock off the quad weak dragon, so he gets off another Earth Power before Drayden breaks out a Hyper Potion. While Flygon's recovering though, Luminion can use two blasts of icy wind to knock him out, taking the Opelousa Gym Leader down to one. Haxorus is up last and gets down to dancing while Flo uses icy wind. Then, after we attempt to switch out to Spice, a Dragon Tail forces us to go straight back out to the water type. Thanks to Luminion dodging Dragon Tail, she's able to blow Haxorus away with one final Icy Wind. The Legend Badge makes seven, meaning there's only one unit of a gym battle left now. Before we can go after that final badge though, we've got one more thing to take care of in Opelucid City. On our way out of town, Team Plasma frees everything up, so we've got to take on Zinzolin before we can leave. This is yet another 3 on 3 battle, which is nothing new in terms of numbers, but at least our team will be. Against the Team Plasma Sage, our trio will be made up of Jolteon, Abra, and Sneasel. That's pretty good, and at least one of them will do well on the ice. Sparky the Jolteon's at level 46 with Discharge, Sand Attack, Thunder Wave, and Thunder. Our second level 46, Kebab the Abra's 
only got hidden power. Zinzelin's whole team is weak to the same typing, so who needs more than one move? Lastly, Vanta the Sneasel at level 48 with the moves Metal Claw, Screech, Agility, and Slash. Alright, let's do this. We'll get back to that in a second, but I just wanted to take a break to see if you felt like subscribing. Over 90% of the people who watch my videos aren't subscribed, which I think might be the worst on YouTube. You can also check out my second channel where I play other games, my Twitch, and my Twitter. They'll all be linked in the description. Okay, sorry, believe me, I hated that more than you did. Let's just get back to the video. Zinzulin leads off with Cryogonal and we send out Jolteon. Summoning thunder from above, Sparky aims the crash of electricity at the living snowflake who sets up a reflect as a counter? It's basically impossible to hit thunder twice in a row if history is any indication, so we call for discharge instead. It falls just short of taking down Cryogonal, but it does at least leave it paralyzed. That doesn't actually have any effect as Zinzelin calls for Ice Beam before Sparky finishes things with another discharge. When the Team Plasma Sage switches out to... Cryogonal? Okay. We go straight for Thunder Wave. After the Paralysis, we make a switch of our own out to Sneasel right as the Reflect wears off. With a base defense stat of just 30, Cryogonal is absolutely destroyed by Vanta's Metal Claw, forcing Zinzelin to call on his ace, Weavile. We then make another switch, bringing Jolteon back out, but after a Thunder Wave, Night Slash takes him down. Abra enters the battle last, and thanks to Sparky, outspeeds his paralyzed opponent to use hidden power. Kebab's fighting type energy annihilates Weavile in one, handing us the win over Zinzelin so we can finally leave Opelucid City. Our next battle will be in Humalau City against the final Unova gym leader Marlin, so we'll have to draw another team of three. Why does everyone in Unova only have three Pokemon? It just seems weird. Anyway, we're going to be using Snivy, Rhydon, and Braviary. That's a really difficult team to judge here. Marlin's a water type specialist, so Snivy's a good type matchup, but still pretty weak. Rhydon is then the complete opposite, strong but quad weak to everything. Finally, Braviary is pretty neutral, so this really could go either way. We've got Basil the Snivy at level 49 with the moves Leaf Storm, Leech Seed, Coil, and Leaf Blade. Vito the Rhydon's also at 49, and he's got Drill Run, Tail Whip, Hammer Arm, and Return. Then at 51, Bonnet the Braviary's got Superpower, Tailwind, Wing Attack, and Slash. Okay, let's get into it. The final Unova Gym battle gets going with Marlin's Caracosta facing off against Snivy. After getting in close, Basil strikes the Rock Turtle with a Leaf Blade that almost one-shots him. Caracosta catches Snivy as he attempts to escape and uses Crunch before Marlin sprays his first Pokemon with a Hyper Potion. While he's recovering though, Snivy's able to connect twice with Leaf Blade to give us the early advantage. When Waylord enters the battle on Marlin's side, we call for a Leaf Storm which slices into the Whale, badly injuring him. Marlin then instructs his Waylord to use Bounce which sees the 900 pound beast leap into the sky. We recall Basil and send out Braviary who's only clipped by Waylord on the way down instead of being absolutely crushed. Gliding toward the pool, Bonnet slashes into Waylord, knocking him out to take Marlin down to one. Jellicent's up last, but after a couple of wing attacks land, Cursed Body, a Citrus Berry, and Recover basically wipe out everything we've done. With wing attack disabled, we switch again, this time bringing in Rhydon who... Oh, never mind. After Vito goes down, we send out Snivy who attacks again with Leaf Storm, leaving Jellicent on the cusp of fainting. Ominous Wind isn't quite enough to knock off Basil, so he strikes with a Leaf Blade to take down Jellicent and earn us the Wave Badge, filling the final spot in our case. That qualifies us for the Pokemon League, but we'll have to take care of Team Plasma before we can head through Victory Road. They're stationed on the Plasma Frigate, and we've got a face-off with Colrus in front of us before we can leave the ship. Bizarrely, as we approach the Elite Four, we're having to draw more than three cards for the first time. Against the USS Plasma's Chief Science Officer, we'll be using the team of Murkrow, Agron, Eevee, Fione, and Arcanine. Okay, I will absolutely take that. First up, Querno the Agron's at level 50 and he's equipped with Dig, Iron Defense, Roar, and Takedown. Our second level 50, Corvus the Murkrow's got Faint Attack, Mean Look, Nightshade, and Wing Attack. Level 50 number 3 is Ionic the Eevee and his moveset's made up of Bite, Charm, Sand Attack, and Return. Apple the Fiona is also at level 50 and it's got Surf, Charm, Supersonic, and Water Pulse. Finally, our ace at level 52 is Fenrir the Arcanine and he has Flamethrower, Leer, Roar, and Heat Wave. I'm feeling pretty confident here. Let's get into it. Colorus calls on his Magneton first and we send out Agron. Querno starts things by burrowing underground, avoiding a Thunder Wave, and then surfaces to attack with Dig. The quad effective attack blasts Magneton out of the air, but Sturdy prevents the knockout. 
Thanks to its ability kicking in, Magneton's able to connect with Thunder Wave to paralyze Agron. A Colorus full restore, Aquarino dig, and Magneton's sturdy take us right back to where we were. Sadly, a Volt Switch actually keeps us from getting the battle's first knockout. Metang replaces Magneton, and when Agron's paralysis keeps him from moving, a Meteor Bash knocks him down. Once again, Cuerno digs underground to avoid a hit before coming back up to attack. Another Meteor Mash cracks Agron, leaving both Pokemon in red health, but Dig fails, blocking another knockout from our side. One final Meteor Mash finishes off Cuerno, handing Colrus the lead, somehow. We send out Fenrir the Arcanine, who leaps onto the battlefield and sends a flamethrower right at Metang, tying things up immediately. Magnazone is the third member of Colrus's team, and flamethrower forces Sturdy to kick in yet again. Even though that means Arcanine ends up paralyzed too, a burn takes down Magnazone to give us the lead. When Colorus sends out his Kling Clang, we switch out to Fione. It's tough to figure out exactly what the Pokemon researcher is going for with repeated shift gears, but it allows Apple to extend our advantage with Surf. Behem's up next and we recall Fione and send out Murkrow. A couple of faint attacks wipe out Behem, leaving only the 1 HP Magneton from the start. As Corvus goes for a Nightshade to finish the battle, it occurs to me that I never used Eevee, so... Oops. That one's on me. That is actually the only battle we'll have to do aboard the Plasma Frigate, because Getsus is running from us. The Plasma Leader does have a full team though, so once we catch up to him, we're gonna have to draw six cards. For our battle with Getsus, we're gonna be using... Suwaddle, Execute, Mantine, Pidgeot, Charmeleon, and... Shuckle. Yeah, this might be tough. Let's run through the movesets. I'll be the Executes at level 50, and he's got Solar Beam, Hypnosis, Leech Seed, and Confusion. Lettuce the Swaddles also at 50, and Bug Bite, String Shot, Endure, and Razor Leaf make up his moveset. Glide the Mantine is also level 50, and he's got Surf, Confuse Ray, Signal Beam, and Air Slash. Togo the Pidgeot has the moves U-Turn, Agility, Sand Attack, and Wing Attack. Serial the Charmeleon's got Shadow Claw, Smokescreen, Dig, and Firefang on hand. Finally, Lowly the Shuckles at level 52, and he's equipped with Bug Bite, Shell Smash, Power Split, and Stone Edge. I am really not looking forward to this one. Let's give it a shot. Our first 6 on 6 battle gets started with Cofagrigus facing off against Execute. We call for Hypnosis, which Albi lands, so we switch out to Charmeleon, who's a bit more capable of dealing damage. Unfortunately, a single Shadow Claw wakes up Cofagrigus, who retaliates by spraying Toxic Sludge at Serio, badly poisoning him. It takes two more tries and Charmeleon's blasted by a Shadow Ball, but eventually he picks up the first win of the match. When Getsis sends out his Seismid Hode, we've just got to accept our fate. With Serio poisoned and struggling to move, we call for a Smokescreen to lower the Warty Frog's accuracy before a Muddy Water ties things up. We send out Sawaddle next and call for a Razor Leaf, which he quickly fires at Seismid Hode. The quad effective move slices through the water type for a fairly surprising one shot. Electros is up next for Getsis, and although Lettuce manages to pull off a bug bite, Acrobatics just destroys him to level up the match once again. We send Albi back into battle, and he succeeds with Hypnosis for a second time. While he's absorbing light for a solar beam from inside this cave, though, Electros wakes up. Getsis asks him how he likes his eggs in the morning, and apparently the answer is horrifically burnt. Somehow, Execute survives a flamethrower to get off the planned Solar Beam, but it's also not enough for a knockout. That allows Electros to earn KO number 2 with Acrobatics and hand the lead back to Getsis. We call on Mantai next, which sort of demonstrates the dire straits we're in, hoping he can finish things before Electros can hit any quad effective moves. A full restore from Getsis does seem a little bit problematic, but Electros can't attack while recovering, so Glide fills the cave with a double dose of Surf to leave us in a 3 on 3. This one's a real roller coaster. Getsis brings his Hydreigon out next, which is only a little bit terrifying. Glide's Signal Beam lands before the dragon can get off an attack, but his Rock Slide hammers down right after it connects. The Life Orb Hydreigon's holding drains a bit of his HP before a second Signal Beam hits, just managing to earn Mantine the win. This is pretty heroic stuff from Glide. When Getsis calls on Toxicroak, we see that his ability is Anticipation and not Dry Skin, so we're free to use Surf. The wave crashes through the slowly flooding cave, sending Toxicroak slamming into the wall, and thanks to a critical hit, it knocks him out too. This incredible run from Mantine has left Getsis with only his Drapion, so we're more or less in the clear here. We make a switch out to Pidgeot to give him a chance, and basically just focus on lowering Drapion's accuracy. Then, after Togo falls, we call on Shuckle to hopefully earn us the win. 
Power Split averages out the two Pokemon's attack and from there Drapion basically has no chance. Even though it takes several turns, Loli picks off Drapion with Stone Edge to finally get us past Getsis. This battle took a long, long time. I had to keep switching up movesets and kept losing one-on-ones, but that legendary performance from Glide the Mantine was exactly what we needed. Thankfully, we're done with Team Plasma now, so it's time to head through Victory Road to the Pokemon League. There is one more battle before we can challenge the Elite Four, though. Hugh's showing up one last time, which honestly seems fairly pointless. Across all of our battles, he hasn't really done much, so let's see what he can pull off against Mr. Mime, Golduck, Larvesta, and Apom. That's a nicely balanced team with a couple of strong Pokemon. Hopefully, they should be able to add another one to the win column. Marceau the Mr. Mime is at level 55 with the moves Psychic, Reflect, Light Screen, and Magical Leaf. Marla the Golduck's also at 55 and she's got Surf, Screech, Disable, and Confusion. Our third level 55 is Atlas the Larvesta and his moveset's made up of Flame Charge, String Shot, Double Edge, and Bug Bite. Lastly, we've got Quiff the Apom, who's at level 57, with Brick Break, Screech, Agility, and Return. Okay, for the last time, let's see what Hugh can do. The battle gets underway with Unpheasant facing off against Golduck. Mala sends a Surf rolling across the battlefield, knocking the flyer back, but he counters with a U-turn, returning straight to his Pokeball. Bufalant comes out next, but Golduck doesn't let up. Even though he's seeing red and nearly runs Mala through with a Wild Charge, she's able to score the knockout with Surf. Hugh sends out his Simi Sage next, and we just continue to press. Another Golduck Surf hits its target before a powerful Energy Ball finally cuts her down. We swap in Larvesta and call for a Bug Bite, but Hugh's Simi Sage is ready, striking the cave ceiling with his tail. Rocks begin crashing down from above, landing on and crushing Atlas to give Hugh the lead. That's not good. We send out Mr. Mime next, and with a single blast of Psychic Energy, the playing field is leveled. Simi Sage faints, making way for Samurott as I misclick twice, attempting to run away from Hugh. Eventually, I settle on switching out to Apon instead of fleeing, but it's a real mismatch. Quiff does hit with return once, but Surf washes him away to leave us with only one. Marceau re-enters the battle and conjures a rake of leaves that he shoots at Samurott. The attack massively weakens him, but he has just enough left to retaliate with a super effective X Scissor. Mr. Mime actually takes the hit surprisingly well, but before another magical leaf can land, Hugh breaks out a Max Potion. For like the 20th time in this run though, that recovery period is just long enough for us to finish the job. Marceau wipes out Samurott, leaving Hugh with only his badly weakened Unpheasant. As soon as he leaves his Pokeball, one blast of Psychic flings him into the cave wall, knocking him out to secure our victory. That one was really close though. Two or three more rival battles and I think he would have had us. Honestly, we definitely didn't beat him on the first try here, so credit where it's due, Hugh pulled one tough battle out right at the death. Now that we've defeated him though, it's finally time to take on the Elite Four and see if we're worthy of a battle with the Unova Champion. You can of course match the Unova Elite Four in any order, but they all have the same number of team members and I have to draw cards for specific battles, so we're going from left to right. That means Chantal's up first, and against the Ghost-type specialist, we'll be using... Ninkada, Mareep, Clefable, and Persian. That's not too bad. Panzer the Ninkada's up first at level 56, and he's got Shadow Ball, Harden, Sand Attack, and Mud Slap. Yuki the Mareep is the same, and she has Thunder, Confuse Ray, Thunder Wave, and Discharge. Cernan the Clefable is also at 56 with Shadow Ball, but his accompanying moves are Sing, Ice Beam, and Metronome. Lastly, at level 58, we've got Babu the Persian, and his moveset's made up of Faint Attack, Screech, Taunt, and Bite. This team wasn't the best on paper, but they really have pretty great movesets for this matchup. Our Elite Four run begins with Chantal's Kafagragus taking on our Ninkata. There's just something about Kafagragus that troubles me. You just never have an easy battle with one. Unsurprisingly, this one's no different. Even with Panzer landing a clutch critical hit, Chantal takes the lead thanks to a Kafagragus Shadow Ball. When Persian enters the battle, we're sent back to square one by a full restore. This time around, we can't completely take advantage of the recovery period because Kafagragus wipes out Babu's ability. Then, before a faint attack can KO the ghost, Will-O-Wisp burns Persian. That was not a good start. When Chantal sends out Golurk, Babu rushes across the battlefield to attack with Bite. Golurk shakes off the burnt cat and slams an arm across his back, almost snapping him in half. After the burn wipes out what's left of Persian's HP, we're down to two and switch out to Clefable. On entry, Cernan fires an Ice Beam at Golurk and the super effective attack levels up the match. 
Chandelure is up third for Chantal, and thanks to a misfire on Fire Blast, Clefable is able to pick her off without taking a hit. That was really weirdly worded. When Chantal sends out her final Pokemon Driftblim, we switch out to Yuki the Marie. By this point we're in complete control, so this was just to make sure of our victory. Yuki's main job was to paralyze and confuse Driftblim, but she's ultimately defeated, taking us into a one-on-one. -on -one. When Cernan re-enters the battle, his job is basically done. A couple of ice beams pop the balloon to take Clefable's elimination total to three. Didn't even take a hit. That was pretty impressive. Anyway, that's one down and Grimsley's up next. The dark type member of the Unit of Elite Four can be tough, so let's see which four Pokemon we'll be using. Our second Pokemon League team will be Starmie, Shelder, Ponyta, and Mawile. Finally! I don't even care about the other three. We've got Mawile. There's no way we're losing here. At level 58, Fiacla the Mawile has Brick Break, Iron Defense, Baton Pass, and Iron Head. You know, it's weird to me that there are people out there who don't consider Mawile the best Pokemon. It's just very odd. Anyway, we've also got Nova the Starmie, Etna the Ponyta, and Shelder Duval, but nobody really cares about them. Let's get this going. Grimsley leads off with his Light Part, and we start with the legendary Pokemon Mawile. Fake Out and Night Slash are both things that happen, and Fiacla just could not care less. Brick Break slams Lipard right down into the dirt, knocking her out to make it Mawile 1, Grimsley 0. When Crocodile comes out, I decide to switch for some reason? Ugh. Nova the Starmie gets the win with Surf, but that was really mostly Fiacla. Scrafty's up next for Grimly, and after another Surf, she takes down Nova with Crunch. We send out Shelder next and call for Explosion, because sometimes that's just kind of the mood I'm in. The double knockout leaves Grimsley with only his Bisharp, and to use our whole team, we send out Ponyta. In fairness, Etna's Flare Blitz just absolutely decimates Bisharp to actually make a mark on the match. So it wasn't all Mawile, but her leadership led us to victory. Good work, Fiacla. Alright, Caitlyn's up next. Against the Psychic-type member of the Unova Elite Four, we're going to be using Jinx, Natu, Dragonair, and Oshawott. Okay, not feeling great about that. We don't have typings that hurt us necessarily, but they don't help much either, and this team is pretty weak for an Elite Four battle. Lockhart the Jinx is up first at level 56, and her moveset's made up of Shadow Ball, Lovely Kiss, Fake Tears, and Powder Snow. Redwing the Natu's also at 56, and she's got Ominous Wind, Confuse Ray, Wish, and Nightshade. Falcor the Dragonair is our third level 56, and he's equipped with Dragon Rush, Agility, Thunder Wave, and Dragon Rage. Last, and probably least, we've got Freckle the Oshawott at level 58 with the moves Razor Shell, Swords Dance, Fury Cutter, and Aqua Jet. Let's just hope this team is better than they look. Caitlyn's Musharn is the first Pokemon out, and we call on Jinx. Lockhart's Lovely Kiss puts her to sleep? I'm not entirely convinced that changed anything. Somehow a Shadow Ball blasting Musharna isn't enough to wake her up, so Jinx fires off another to give us the lead. Maybe I overestimated Caitlyn or underestimated this team. We try to execute the same strategy against Sigilyph, but she's rightly terrified of Jinx and dodges the Lovely Kiss. Lockhart then gets a taste of her own medicine when Sigilyph attacks with Shadow Ball before Lovely Kiss lands at the second attempt. Unlike Musharna, one Shadow Ball does wake up Sigilyph, who counters with an identical move. While we're watching Jinx faint, I'd like to let you all know a secret about Sigilyph. It's actually just a weird lampshade being controlled Ratatouille style by the unknown exclamation mark on its head. Its power of flight is granted entirely by the two unknown E on its sides. Anyway, Natu's Ominous Wind casts aside the unknown trio even after a full restore and she gets the across the board stat boost for good measure. Caitlyn calls on her Gothitelle next who starts with a Calm Mind after Redwing uses a Confuse Ray. For some reason that scares me into using Nightshade instead of Ominous Wind so Gothitelle's barely hurt when she sends a Thunderbolt crashing into Natu. Redwing's just completely wiped out by the hit, so we send in Dragonair next, who starts by paralyzing Gothitelle. Caitlyn's ace just does not care about status inflictions, though. Paralyzed and confused, Gothitelle ignores both to attack with Psychic, badly injuring Falcor. Dragon Rush then deals some good damage that Gothitelle brushes off before again, pretending she's fine and using Psychic. That's too much for Dragonair, who faints, leaving us with only Oshawott. When Freckle arrives on the battlefield, we just have to play the odds. Surely Gothitelle won't be able to freely attack again. We call for a sword stance, and finally, Caitlyn's ace is frozen in place by Paralysis Ace. Hmm? 
Oshawott swings at the motionless psychic type with Razor Shell, cutting her down to take us into another Elite Four one on one. Rayuniclus is up last, and with Freckle already on the opponent's side of the field, we call for another Razor Shell. Oshawott Scowl Chop slices through the powerhouse of the cell, but it's not quite enough for a one shot. Rayuniclus gathers herself and focuses, firing a super effective energy ball right at Freckle. The attack connects, sending Oshawott flying, but somehow she survives the hit. Struggling back to her feet, Freckle uses all of her remaining energy to close the distance and strike with Razor Shell once more. That powerful attack takes down Reuniclus, so we just recall Oshawott before she passes out and the Pokemon League call this one as a draw. That was some pretty incredible stuff from Oshawott. I really thought we'd lost this before she even entered the battle. Alright, that leaves only one. Marshall is the last Elite Four member standing in our way, and against his fighting type team, we'll have the use of Electabuzz, Ducklet, Luxio, and Mewtwo. Well, good luck to Marshall, I guess. There's a bit of history in this series of drawing Mewtwo in battles that will just make things entirely impossible for our opponents. I'm feeling pretty confident about making it through to the champion here. The movesets are on screen right now, you can pause and take a look at Stripes, Splash, Shuriken, and Cloney, but really, I think we all know how this battle's gonna go. Usually when I have one incredible Pokemon, I lead off with them, but I thought I'd let the others have some fun before Mewtwo came out. Stripe the Electabuzz, Splash the Ducklet, and Shuriken the Luxio actually combine to knock off Throw and Conkeldur, meaning Marshall's only got half his team left when Mewtwo comes out. That's not great for him. After all of the big talk, we're actually only a critical hit away from Sork one-shotting Cloney with Payback. That would have been pretty fitting, honestly. Sturdy can't save you forever, though. Psychic blows away Sork, sending him crashing through the wall for having the audacity to injure Mewtwo, and Mianxiao doesn't make the same mistake. Psychic one-shots Marshall's final Pokemon, finishing off the Elite Four and earning our passage through to the champion. Before we get into this, I think we all need to just take a second to wonder why the hell the damn statue doesn't line up with the door to the champion's room. That bothers me way more than it should. Anyway, for our 6 on 6 battle with the Unova champion Iris, we're going to be using Weavile, Altaria, Deerling, Hypno, Coughing, and Nosepass. I don't really know what to make of that. The average base stat total of Iris's team is over 540, which is pretty ridiculous, and we're at around 420. So we're not particularly close, but it could be worse. Returning from his earlier appearance, Vanta has evolved into a Weavile, and he's got Ice Punch, Quick Attack, Faint Attack, and Brick Break. Cirrus the Altaria has got Dragon Breath, Sing, Dragon Dance, and Dragon Pulse. Bambi the Deerling has the moves Return, Sand Attack, Leech Seed, and Jump Kick. Polo the Hypno has Psychic, Hypnosis, Swagger, and Hyper Beam. Our 5th level 57 is Sputter the Coughing, and he's equipped with Return, Smokescreen, Destiny Bond, and Explosion. Lastly, we've got Nazim the Nosepass at level 59, and he has Stone Edge, Thunder Wave, Rest, and Spark on hand. Alright, one last time, let's give this a try. Iris sends out her High Dragon to start the battle, and we lead off with our Weavile. Vanta's Brick Break is countered by a Flamethrower, and as both Pokemon are working with non-stab super effective moves, they're both left injured but ready to fight off. Not entirely sure why I didn't go for Ice Punch there. As Weavile is lightning fast, he lands another Brick Break before High Dragon can attack, so Iris goes behind after just a couple of turns. Iris calls on Drudigan next, and Vanta swings at her with an Ice Punch that instantly destroys her. Drudigan, not Iris. When Haxorus comes out third, another Weavile Ice Punch connects, but unlike Drudigan, she lives the hit and counters with an earthquake. The entire building shudders and begins crumbling, and Vanta's left unconscious. That was a really strong start, though. We send out Altaria second as Iris breaks out a full restore, and Haxorus' recovery period allows him to attack twice with Dragon Breath. That's more than enough to hand Cirrus the win and take our advantage back to two. When Lapras comes out, we switch Altaria for Hypno, who's immediately blasted by an Ice Beam. Polo takes the hit well and goes on the offensive, putting Lapras to sleep with Hypnosis. Repeated attacks land while Lapras snoozes away, and thanks to a critical hit on Polo's second, he stretches our advantage further. Iris sends out Agron next, and we're treated to another back and forth. Polo does succeed in putting Agron to sleep after a couple of turns, but a short nap means the Horned Beast can earn the knockout with Double Edge. We send out Deerling next, who's summarily fired backwards by an Agron Double Edge. Bambi returns to his feet and leaps into the air, spinning 180 degrees and landing a jump kick right on Agron's jaw. The force of the kick shuts Agron's mouth and topples the monster to restore our advantage and leave Iris with only one. 
Archaeops has a lot of work to do here, which he gets quickly on top of cutting down Deerling with acrobatics. We send out Nosepass, who's actually pretty badly hurt by a rock slide before he can catch Archaeops with a Thunder Wave. From there, it's a fairly free road to victory. Nazim attacks with a trio of sparks that take Archaeops out of the air, knocking him out and leaving Iris unable to battle. I completely forgot to send out Coughing, so sorry about that sputter. Knowing me, it probably would have been a one-turn explosion kind of appearance anyway. That's it! We've been crowned champion and have officially beaten Pokemon White 2 with random teams drawn from cards for every major battle. We ended on a fairly easy one, but you get that sometimes with these challenges. Even then, on paper, it was far from easy. Weavile's just a total beast. There were some really tough battles in there, though. Getsis, Caitlyn, Hugh, the whole Pokemon World Tournament, there were a lot of difficult challenges. I'm not sure how this works as a singular video, but if you made it this far, please tell me what you thought. This took way too long to put together as you can probably tell, so thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.